Hey everyone, I'm Matt and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. Today we have some UFO documents to show you, including one that I discovered in early 2023. Joining me to discuss this uh, UFO is UFO researcher Sean Rosh. If I messed his name up, I'm pretty bad about last names. But first, do us a solid and hit that subscribe and thumbs, but, uh, thumbs up button on YouTube. You can also find us on Twitter at Good Trouble Show and all other social media platforms at Good uh, Trouble Show. Uh, our Twitter following is actually pretty small, so we would appreciate your follow. And uh, we have all the links uh, to all of our social media accounts in the YouTube uh, subscription so, uh, description. So if, you're, if you aren't following us, we, of course, appreciate your follow, subscribe, all that uh, kind of stuff. Uh, leave a comment, share, like, thumbs up, and subscribe. All these things, as I always say, these encourage these platforms to spread the word about our show to the masses that do not track the UFO subject. You can also find us on your favorite podcasting platform. Just search for The Good Trouble Show. Finally, we need help keeping the lights on. You can become a supporter of The Good Trouble Show by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the good trouble show and for the price of a starbucks coffee you can support our work finally on youtube super chats are open and a great way to show your financial appreciation for our work allowing us to bring you great guests okay enough uh, enough with that commercial on july uh, 2nd of 20 uh, sorry july 26 i think of 2023 former intelligence official turned whistleblower david grush testified at a historic meeting on ufos to the house oversight committee grush revealed to congress the existence of a ufo back engineering and recovery program that had been hidden from congress for years he also mentioned this okay and uh, referring to your news nation interview you had referenced uh, specific treaties between governments um Article three of the nuclear arms treaty with Russia identifies UAPs. It specifically mentions yep. them. To your knowledge, are there safety measures in place with foreign governments or other superpowers to avoid an escal escalatory situation in the event that a UAP um, malevolent, malevolent event occurs? Uh, yeah, you're referring to actual uh, public treaty in the UN register. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah, the agreement on measures to reduce the risk of outbreak of nuclear war signed in 1971. Uh, unclassified treaty publicly available. And if you cite the George Washington uh, University National Security Archives, you will find uh, the declassified in 2013 specific provisions in the specific uh, red line flash message traffic with the specific codes pursuant to Article 3 and, and Article uh, also Situation 2, which is in the the previously classified NSA archive. What I would recommend, and I, I tried to get access, but uh, uh, I got a wall of silence at the White House, uh, was those specific incidents when those um, message traffic was used. I think uh, some scholarship on that would open the door to a further investigation uh, using those publicly available information. So uh, today we will discuss the treaty David Grush mentioned along with the document he referred to that I discovered in February of this year, along with some exciting files from the CIA and one from the National Archives in Australia, Australia that is jaw-dropping. Joining me today to discuss this is the host of the Finding Anomalous YouTube uh, show and podcast, uh, Sean uh, Rosh. Sean, how are you? Good, how are you? Thanks Did for I having me, Matt. You're good. Did I butcher your last name? Uh, no, no, it, <laughs> it, it was pretty good. I was actually very impressed. You know, I almost fell out of my chair, but I held it together. I, I, I love that. When, when I had uh, Admiral Tim, uh, I still screwed up, Galladay on, I completely butchered his name. I, and oh, one of my right. earlier in, earlier interviews, and of course, I was really nervous and all that, all that kind of stuff. But um, anyway, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. So how are you feeling yeah. after this whole uh, UAP Disclosure Act debacle in the House uh, uh, prompted by Congressman Mike Turner, who's on my uh, S list, as I like to call it? Yeah. Um, well, it's, I think it's, it's good that we're making headway, but it's also disappointing that some key things got gutted out of uh, the UAPDA. But what is really interesting to me is kind of the odd warning we got, uh, everybody got, that if something wasn't going to happen, we may get some sort of catastrophic disclosure. 
And what's interesting is, you know, the UAPDA got gutted, but all of a sudden, Grush has given two interviews. We got a full hour with Gary Nolan, with Tim Gollett and a News Nation. So, I, you know, as long as things keep going in that direction, keep gutting the UAPDA. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that this will end up being just kind of a template. Oh, your audio is oh, your audio's you popping a little bit. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, just real grumbly for some reason. Sorry about that. Huh. Uh, well, that's no good. Is that any better? Mm-mm. Hmm. <laughs> it's like right, weird, well, that's, like that's, popping or something. Yeah, okay. So why don't you talk for a bit while I uh, plug and replug okay. my microphone? So it's uh, sure. It's all you. Okay. Yeah, so I guess it's all me. As you can see back there, I have a guitar. I got a picture up there. No, I have my own podcast, the Sean Roush Podcast, and... Uh, I show documents, old documents. I also have uh, guests on the show. I've had, I actually conducted the last interview with Senator Harry Reid that he ever had, which is, which is pretty intense. And I had a lot of technical difficulties during that too. The first hour we, we were struggling to even get them live on the camera. Um, and they almost quit his assistant called and they said, well, let's just reschedule and, um, I decided to try to push through, and we got him on the phone and finished it up and got maybe a good solid 15 minutes. Is, uh, um, he was a really nice guy, too. No, no, not any better, no. Okay. Okay. All right, let's, stay, let's dig in. Let's uh, dig into this. Okay, so uh, sure. this is your first document here, Memorandum for Director of Central Intelligence uh, through Deputy Director of Intelligence. Yeah. Subject, Unidentified Flying Objects, 1952. So, um, yeah, so... The, the best part about this document really is bullet point four. And these are some of the hints that you get when you look at these files. You can read it, it says recent reports reaching CIA indicated that further action was desirable. And another briefing by the Cognizant A2 attic personnel held on 25th November. Now that's the Air Force. At this time, reports of incidents convince us that there is something going on that must have immediate attention. The details of some of these incidents have been discussed by ADSI with DTCI, sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes, traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. Am I on the right document here, what you're reading, what you're looking at? Yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Just making yeah. sure. So I was just reading bullet point four. So right there they're saying... Exactly what we hear now. Unexplained objects, great heights, great altitudes, great speeds, vicinity of major U.S. defense installations, and they're not attributable to natural phenomenon or known types of aerial vehicles. I think that's quite a statement in a 1952 document because, as we can see, we're in the same place today. You know, oh, so wow. people who want to say that you know these are natural phenomena or these are uh, some type of aerial vehicle. Well, how do you explain the same issue at major defense sites and installations, which we know are nuclear bases, right? Mm -hmm. It's still going on today. You know, yeah. you have to be able to explain all that and not just uh, pick what you want to talk about, pretty much. You know, like debunkers do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, we, we, know, uh, we know those guys. Uh, okay, so let's see here. So, um, I turned your mic up, so hopefully you can hear people can hear you a little bit better. Uh, let me turn sure. mine up as well. Check, check, check. Okay. All right. So we're done with that one. Uh, let's see. I'm going to minimize this. And let's see. Flying saucers. Uh, executive summary. The National Security Council. That's that's yes. uh, that's pretty big. <laughs> that's pretty much as big as it gets now this was the impetus for a draft memo that they were going to send to the national security council and i don't think they wound up doing it but this little memo here is is pretty interesting the bullet point two is pretty good because it says the third sentence down, it says a broader coordinated effort should be initiated to develop a firm scientific understanding of several phenomena which are apparently involved in these reports and to assure ourselves that the incidents will not hamper our present efforts in the Cold War or confuse our early warning system in case of an attack. And remember that early warning system part for when we uh, 
our later on in the show. Right. So I thought it was interesting because several phenomena, we hear that too from Arrow, right? That it's, you know, it's Arrow, sure, but uh, they say that several phenomena are in fact probably, um, you know, the cause for, for some of these incidents. So that's another thing that they've known for this long, you know, the whole point of these documents is to really prove how long they've been aware of this. You know, this isn't uh, since Arrow or since uh, Lou Elizondo came out, this has been um, plaguing the military for since 52. Otherwise, they wouldn't stand up a new office and spend a bunch of taxpayer money to really just give us the same answers as they had in 1952. You know, uh, it's kind of asinine when you think about it. So, I mean, and obviously that's not the case. There's something going on that they don't want us to know. Yeah, that's if, if there's one thing we've uh, learned, they're uh, <laughs> they are they're really good at lying to the public, lying to Congress, and uh, probably lying to presidents. It's uh, it's a feature, not a bug, with uh, the CIA and, yeah. and uh, others. Okay, let's take a look at this one. This is um, this again, uh, 1952. So we're going back to the 1950s. Here it was classified as top secret, and uh, mm -hmm. was somehow declassified. Obviously, there's some re redactions here. Uh, probably mm -hmm. uh, names. Um, but yeah, yeah what do we have this is a this is a deputies meeting. So this is December twelfth, nineteen fifty two. Um, let's scroll down to B. So it says A B uh, stated that the memo prepared by ADSI on flying saucers did not contain the information he desired. Mister Armory, who is uh, the, a CIA scientist, noted that this was probably due to blank being over cautious in regard to the information at hand. However. So now we hear about Mike Turner a lot. Mike Turner represents the district that Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is at, where this stuff happened. So in that um, part number B, he goes on to say, both doctors were at Wright-Patterson Field today, attending a meeting of the Air Technical Intelligence Committee at which the subject was discussed, and the director delayed reporting to the president on flag saucers till the 19th of December. And then it also says, that Mr. Armory stated that the FBI liaison officer had indicated that him, that to him that Mr. Hoover from the FBI wished that the Bureau was kept informed on the subject. And these are all things that they never told anybody. So it's also interesting to keep in mind that during this time in 1952, this stuff was happening and the public had no idea, you know, that they were taking this stuff this seriously and that they were this um, confused about what was happening because as far as they were concerned, the Air Force came out in 1949 or so, or maybe in 19, 1950, actually, they said they canceled the flying saucer project. It's over. It's nothing. There's nothing to it, you know? <laughs> right. Um, and then in 1952, that's officially when Project Blue Book, as we know it, started in the debunking campaign, which uh, documents will, will show that we'll get into. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I, I was really kind of surprised. I'll show you, I'll kind of go through some of mine. We've got uh, three more of yours and then a really significant one that is out of, um, out of, out of Australia. So, um, so somebody was asking when these were declassified. I, I, I'd have to read. It's, sorry, going ahead. Oh, well, some of them have the data on there, I think like 2001 or 2004. So th these have been out there for a while, but it, mm -hmm. it's not common knowledge. You know, people don't know that it was taken this seriously that long ago because, you know, it's not on NBC News or whatever that these documents are out. They're not going through them, you know. Right. I mean, but there's ufologists who have and have compiled them in books and such, but it's never, you know, uh, became uh, public knowledge. So. Right. So, so here, 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 I'll show some of the ones that, that I kind of just sort of scanned through. Again, you can see this is from Central Intelligence Agency, Information Report, uh, Country at Sea, Northern Atlanta, Atlantic. Subject, unidentified airborne object. Um, acquired by source. Uh, let's see. So, so here in this, you know, I won't read the whole thing or anything, but it basically describes... Uh, this is, I'm guessing, from the captain of a ship. Uh, he's describing where he was. It was in Nova Scotia, East Coast, U.S. port. It was in chart room just after the bridge when third mate, who was at bridge, checking the compass, shouted out that there was a flying object off the starboard bow. 
I immediately ascended the conning tower, and by this time, the object was on our starboard beam. It was traveling on a reciprocal course to ours about 50 to 100 feet above the water at an estimated speed of over uh, 25 miles per hour. From the conning tower, I, I observed it with my binoculars uh, for a period of approximately one minute and, half, uh, and a half when it disappeared into the horizon in a northeasterly direction. I would estimate that the closest it approached my ship was, uh, was 1,000 feet, and it was an ovular, cylindrical-shaped object. Sounds like a tic-tac, uh, mm. just like which I've never seen before. The object was quite small, and I would judge that it was the diameter of about uh, approximately 10 feet. It had depth, but to what extent I was unable to observe. So this was the something master. This is chief master here. Uh, and it looks like, uh, yeah. yes, the same thing alerted uh, to its presence till it disappeared at night, 15 seconds elapsed. I believe it was traveling at a tremendous rate of speed, possibly faster than 500 miles uh, per hour. We can see here. 70 the, feet off the water. Yeah. And, and then, uh, wow. let's, let's see, I'm trying to zoom this in. Now, there was a third page. Third mate uh, basically says the same thing. Uh, came towards us and I clearly saw its shadow in the water. My impression of the object was that it was elliptical, not unlike a Japanese diamond box in, in, in shape. Uh, right at the bottom there, look, look at this line. All three men were quite evidently very much upset by the sighting, you know? Now wow. that's, that's a clue there when, the, when they include their emotional uh, reaction to seeing something like that. You know, so they wouldn't react that way to, uh, you know, a Russian jet or a Soviet plane or something, you know, like, but th right. th this is actually a kind of a typical sighting in these, in these days. There are so many just like that. Um, and, you know, obviously they were interested. <laughs> yeah, this, this one that I'm going to show you, this one's interesting. So one thing I've noticed in the CIA uh, documents uh, they sometimes refer to these UFOs as unconventional aircraft. So people, sure. people uh, that are uh, for the John Greenwalds of the world, uh, you, that might be a search term that you would want to use. But uh, here it oh, is, yeah. you know, information report, Central Intelligence Agency, sighting of an unconventional craft. Uh, and this is from a guy that was, I'm guessing, some kind of intelligence source. This was October 4th of 55. Oh. I can give you a little context for these couple of reports that, that you've shown it. so far. So typically when CIA got their reports, they got their reports overseas, right? Um, and sometimes they got them from different uh, like foreign source news organizations, or even sometimes the Air Force would send them to the CIA directly. So that's where these came from, just so you know. So it's they, they had different information sources, but yeah. Got it. Okay, let's see which one's here. Let's see. This is a triangular another. object I saw in that one. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, let's see. Here's uh, another one. Uh, this is uh, from 1952. A proposed study of on the flying saucer mm. phenomenon, Intelligence Advisory Committee. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Let's see. And none of the agenda items are of direct interest to the Bureau. However, something blanked out, directed the member's attention to some aspects of the flying saucer phenomenon. He said at a recent uh, pre-something uh, theory on saucers, saucers was made to a German scientist. Yeah, this uh, is a good document. Uh, also was stated that recent saucer observations in Africa presents evidence that the saucers are not a meteorological phenomenon, which theory has been held to date by the Air Force, of course, the Air Force. Uh, instead, this letter incident, uh, this uh, later incident, uh, indicated the possibility of saucers being a scientific development. Uh, details of this observation were not presented, however, um, as a result, uh, military members suggested a logical approach, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, it was further suggested that IAC, I'm not sure what that is, should only concern itself with this matter on the basis that a competent scientific uh, group might determine the saucer's development and control or something like that. Um, anyway, that yeah. was uh, 
Let's see what I else. tried to actually look up that German scientist and that paper that they were referencing, but I, I could not find it for the life of me. But yeah, I remember coming uh, upon this document and becoming very interested because, again, it's just further proof that they had tabs on this. They didn't want to fall behind any other countries, um, and they, you know, were, were interested. So the earliest CIA document I've ever found was actually 1949, mm-hmm. uh, which is a pretty good one. And they say the same, same kind of stuff. And it's the same department, OSI. So we see these 1952 documents, and it they make you think that OSI for CIA just got interested then. But when I found that 49 document, and it was OSI, people talking to each other, you know that's a lie because they were confused in 1949. And you can see, you know, they're still interested in 52. And that's when they put the, together the Robertson panel, which was pretty much just a way to, to debunk uh, flying saucers to the American public. They did God. not want people to be interested in them, mainly because they feared for like psych- psychological purposes and Russia using them to create some sort of mass panic. Well, that's what they put on the documents, at least. But Let's see here. Uh... So here's, here's an interesting one, Office Memorandum, uh, United States Government, to the Acting Assistant Director for Scientific Intelligence. Responsibility for Unidentified Flying Objects, UFOBs. What, do you, what is the B for? Uh, UFOB is just what they called the, the reports, the UFO reports, the Air Force reports. They were called UFOBs. So they're, yeah. it's not referencing the UFO is separate. The UFOB is the report. Anyway, so here it's, uh, I mean, look at all these references to other reports. Uh, memo uh, <laughs> from 53, unidentified sure. flying object, unidentified flying object, intelligence, and responsibility. Those are oh. in there. Uh, and this those is are another. In the, the reading room. Yeah. Oh, are there? Okay, good. One mm-hmm. of the things that I've noticed, another thing the CIA refers, uh, uh, refers to these UFOs as are non conventional mm-hmm. types of, of uh, air vehicles. Um, yeah. uh, so by reference, say this division was assigned responsibility for maintaining current knowledge of sightings of unidentified flying objects. Uh, by reference B, which was received concurrence of the office, the division proposed uh, to handle its exp- uh, responsibilities as follows. A, the project will be considered inactive. Uh, B, incoming material will be reviewed periodically, periodically to segregate references. All material on unidentified objects will be deposited in files for future reference unless it raises an, an immediately recognizable problem of concern for national security. So that was... Uh, so this one, um, mm-hmm. we see 1953 there. The date, right. the date is really crucial because just a couple months before this, the Robertson panel had done their deliberations. And you can read that in the CIA FOIA reading room, but they put in there that there's nothing to this. And what they should worry about is mass panic. They should have an educational campaign to spread the gospel. They actually say that all this stuff is prosaic. So, but you you can see here that that's not what they really thought. And they actually continued to keep tabs on it because this document in 1953, where it goes to the, the chief electronics and physics department, I brought another one. I don't know if you have it or not from 1956 saying the same stuff, saying that these people are still cognizant of this problem and also that they were going to destroy files. Wow. Well, speaking of problem, here's another one from the CIA. This one titled, Subject, Flying Saucers Problem. Uh, This is from uh, (laughs) October 14th, 1952, at an informal discussion between DDI, ADIC, and Acting ADIC. It was agreed that the saucer problem should be attacked by getting together the responsible individuals in the community to work out a program of research and intelligence, which can then be implemented by them directly. The agreed program can then be forwarded to the DCI and possibly the Secretary of Defense and the balance of the National Security Council as an established program rather than waiting for a great deal of formal high-level paper pushing before taking action. Uh, great has, document. Yeah, uh, let's see, DDI, it, uh, go ahead. Well, it shows how the, they were more concerned with uh, tackling the object they, the way they wanted to versus going through the, the typical protocol of, of getting things approved to do this or that, you know. Um, they wanted to go behind the scenes, and those people listed there that Walter, Dr. Walter, Dr. John, Dr. Mm-hmm. Loftus, Dr. James, 
um, those are pretty high up uh, people. You know, these weren't lackeys taking care of this. So do they, do these names ring a bell? Like, do you recognize any uh, of these well, names? Yeah, the the major one that that does is General John A. Sanford. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the the guy in the famous 1952 clip after the D.C. sightings, and he had to talk to the press. You oh, know? got it. Um, so that's him. And so, you know, it's interesting again when you think about that and you watch that video, and to know that, you know, this is the kind of stuff they were talking about and working on behind the scenes that none of no one in the press that was at that video even knew about. You know, right. Uh, okay, here's another good one. Uh, Secret Central Intelligence Agency, uh, March of 1953, the Honorable Secretary of Defense. Uh, dear Mr. Secretary, the Director of, of Central Intelligence has asked that you be furnished a copy of the attached report prepared by a panel of scientists on the subject of unidentified flying objects. This panel was convened at the direction of General Smith following the recommendation of the Intelligence Advisory Committee. The conclusions and recommendations may be of interest to you and the fact that they point out certain potential dangers to national security, which are related to the subject and suggest ways of their elimination. Although this agency does not consider problems arising from sightings of flying saucers, primarily its concern, we shall be pleased to assist in any appropriate action you may deem necessary. So Richard Drain, I mean, that's, that's crazy. I mean, the the mm-hmm. potential dangers to national security, which are related to the subject. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the other documents around this time frame, well, the only thing they put in there is, you know, that these things are seen around sensitive installations. And um, they're also worried about, uh, like, radar phantoms, like us shooting off missiles at something that pops up on a radar you know, mm-hmm. going 3,000 miles per hour and they don't know what it is. And maybe it's nothing, maybe it's something, but um, that could cause, you know, confusion. So that was also one of the things that, that they would had mentioned in other memos. Okay, here's, uh, here's one, January 1953 meeting of OSI Advisory Group on UFO. At 0945, an yeah. ad hoc an ad hoc panel of scientific consultants was convened to review the unidentified flying objects problem. A detailed statement of the problem presented to the group by CIA is attached. It's got Robertson, all these people, following members of uh, OSI staff were there. Uh, let's see. Uh, I believe the following is a fair state. Uh, a final report on the results of the meeting is being prepared for the ADSI. It is believed that the following is a fair statement uh, uh, of the conclusions reached. One, no evidence is available to indicate any physical threat to the security of the United States. Two, no evidence is available to indicate the existence or any use of, of to us, uh, fundamental, fundamental scientific principles. Three, the subject UFO is not of direct intelligence interest. It is of indirect intelligence interest only insofar as any knowledge about the innumerable unsolved mysteries of the universe are of intelligence uh, interest. Uh, Subject of UFOs UFOs is of operational interest for three reasons. A, interference with air defenses by intentional enemy jamming. B, related to interference with air defenses by overloading. uh, Possibility of psychological offenses. Go ahead, sorry. The... the you know, something that I didn't really realize maybe how important that line was is, is number three. The subject UFO is not of direct intelligence interest. It's indirect only as so far as any knowledge about the innumerable unsolved mysteries of the universe. Like, that's not radar anomalies. Right. <laughs> you that's, know? Not, that's not drones or seagulls. Right. That's... That's a pretty heavy line, actually. I, I'm surprised I haven't really, uh, that hasn't really sunk into me before, because that's kind of an omission right there. They're right. tying it directly to another intelligent life, you know, it's, uh, which they always try not to do. So when you find something like that, it's, it's pretty cool. Okay, let's see here. Here's another one. Uh, January 9th, 1953, memorandum for the director of the CIA from the deputy director, or no, sorry, from assistant director. Problem. Uh, to obtain the services of Dr. Louis Alvaros and Dr. Thornton Page as ad hoc consultants to the OSI advisory panel on unidentified flying objects 
scheduled uh, January 14th, 1953. Uh, let's see here. So um, basically, it looks like they're just recommending this guy. Yeah. Uh, Dr. It, Thornton Thornton is, Page was a, yeah. he was a basically a, a debunker or a denier. Luis Alvarez oh, actually came from, the, yeah, Luis Alvarez actually came from some atomic project. I know he had something to do with working on the nuke bombs and stuff. Got it. Got it. Okay. Now, this is an interesting one here. This is actually fairly new. Um, let me say fairly new. What is the date on this? Uh, da, da, da. I had it written down. 1993. Oh, uh, ni um, Taiwan Mainland UFO Symposium closes in Beijing. Uh, researchers at a oh, three-day yeah. symposium, which uh, closed here, said that the sightings cannot be explained by general knowledge or current scientific findings. So the people of, uh, who had not seen UFOs included astronomical observatory stuff. Um, Look at that. There have now been 400,000 reports at the bottom, reports of sightings worldwide. How did they get that number? What database is hmm. that? Well, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. Wow. How do they know that? Yeah, well, 50 research, that's uh, just kind of scanning through here. 400,000. The mainland set up its, oh, this is, oh, so this is what's interesting, too, because I had no idea yeah. about China. The mainland mm -hmm. set up its own UFO investigation body, Curo, in 1978, which is now a member of the Chinese government-supported China Association wow. uh, for Science and Technology. Taiwan's UFO research began in 1973. Um, 3,600 members, wow. And millions that's, of I mean, fans. <laughs> that, yeah, that's, that's huge. Um, it, and that goes to what David Grush says, where there, there's always there's always kind of this uh, Cold War race, you know, in this subject between these different parties. I mean, you know, the George Knapp and whatever, uh, the Soviet documents and stuff, and, you know, China stuff, um, Brazil, all over the place. And that is so, because that's another misnomer is it's a U.S. problem. Why are they only in the U.S.? <laughs> That's yeah. obviously not true, you know. That China uh, set up something to study UFOs because they really liked uh, the Roswell story. <laughs> right. Okay, let's see here. This is a short one. This is from uh, 1976. Priority uh, 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 form dated 916. UFO studies. Source's full name is Blah. He is employed as Blah. Uh, reference B mm. material classified confidential at his request. Source seeks guidance from CIA UFO experts as to material in his report that should remain classified. Well, I don't even know what to say about that. And, th and, th and <laughs> a this UFO I study, though. Yeah, 1976. I only got Where's through. Where's the employee? Yeah, and I only got through like ten pages on this uh, website of stuff. Um, okay. So I yeah I. Uh, let's see. And then we're, I'll get through ours and then I want to uh, come back on yours because yours are much better thought out than mine. Um, CIA uh, information report. Uh, country Netherlands. Netherlands. Fly, flying saucers. Oh, September is this a crash? I don't know. Let's see. They I mean, did uh, have like a Netherlands crash one in there at one point. Well, they redacted the three paragraphs and then they just left this one. Big formation oh, okay. of flying saucers was above uh, Arnhem Mrs. and her four children, blah, blah, blah. So they could see these until they disappeared uh, from the from the south. It's you know, what kind of st strikes me, Sean, is they really have been monitoring this shit. I mean, like, really, yeah. you, mm -hmm. they leave you with the impression that they haven't really been doing anything. But you can. I mean, you're getting reports from the Netherlands and a CIA sure. document is being generated. Uh, I mean, yeah, a, a, a lot of them. And, and you can tell there's, you know, there's even, there's other documents that go into when a, like a Senator, I think Richard Russell was his name, who started, who is really the godfather of Area 51, was out in uh, Russia. Um, and he saw flying saucers outside the window of his train and wow. reported this to the air force the air force sent a top secret classified thing to the cia and they said guess where they sent it they sent it to the group we just looked at the chief of physics and electronics 
and that was in 1955 or 56, you know. And that was also around the time of the Avro car, which people have heard about, which was a dud of a flying saucer. We've seen the videos where it barely hovers off the ground. It's my take that that was kind of a distraction and the real project uh, was something else because they spent, I think, like nine years working on this thing that could only get a foot off the ground. I don't think so. Sometimes I feel that. <laughs> sometimes I feel that way about uh, the broadcasting equipment for my show. It barely gets me one one foot off the ground, or at least the audio doesn't. We've we've, we've seen that. Okay, this this one. Uh, okay, this one I found interesting. Uh, I'm surprised it's unclassified. Uh, header from joint uh, former joint uh, staff Washington. Uh, it's got all these other destinations. Let's see, controls on class serial body USSR China. sub subject USSR public uh, public Re uh, People's Republic of China scientists and joint study of UFOs. Uh, Moscow domestic surface. Uh, a report from Vlad blah blah blah. Scientists of the PRC and the Soviet Far East have begun begun joint study of UFOs. The first meeting of ufologists of the two countries has ended in the small maritime townlet. Maybe it's more like a, well, maybe, I don't know if this was like a government thing. They exchange videos. It's not been chosen. In the last few years, the number of cases of visual observations of US UFOs has no, notably uh, increased there. Okay, so you got that yeah. one. Um, That's an interesting one. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, let's see here. Anomalous um, phenomena, though. It's interesting because people are always uh, like, why do they try to change it from UFO when, in fact, uh, uh, unidentified anomalous phenomena was one of the first uh, words that they used for this stuff in the Air Force in, in 47, 48, 49. They didn't say UAP, but they said unidentified anomalous phenomena. So that's interesting to point out, too. That That is uh, interesting. Now, this one is short. But very, very interesting. This is from 1975, Central Intelligence Agency Operations uh, Center, uh, October 28, 1975. All of this is redacted, but this uh, NMCC, so N NMCC is the National Military Command Center. That's the, the mm -hmm. big bunker at the bottom of the Pentagon that will conduct any sort of uh, major strategic uh, war. Uh, NMCC rep notified Operation Center that uh, DDO oh, yeah. Talker contained update concerning penetration of Loring <laughs> Air Force Base, Maine, by unidentified helicopters flying out of Canada. What the hell? Yeah. Well, it, it, you just mentioned the NMCC. So there's actually a few reports, and I think you, I think they're through the DOD FOIA reading room, maybe. But there are reports to the NMCC about UFOs being seen over Loring there. And also, I think it's maybe in North Dakota or Montana, all the nuclear bases. You know? Is Loring a nuclear and, base? <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure. I think they maybe just housed the weapons or something like that. So it's not, I don't know, if, I don't think it's like Maelstrom or anything. Got but uh, yeah, and at the time, they also called UFOs a lot of times helicopters. There's actually sightings that happened in Vietnam that were actually a pretty big deal, and they just called them enemy helicopters or unidentified helicopters. They're, but they weren't described as such. They're really just unidentified objects. Got it. Okay. Um, going back to in the time machine, 1953, report of the scientific uh, panel on unidentified <laughs> flying objects, January 17th, 1953. The undersigned panel of scientific consultants has set at the request of the government to evaluate any possible threat to national security posed by unidentified flying objects, parentheses flying saucers, and to make recommendations. The panel has received the evidence as presented by uh, something government agencies, primarily the United States Air Force, God bless them, and, uh, yeah, and something just... uh, reviewed. As a result of the consideration, the panel concludes that the evidence presented on unidentifying flying objects shows no indication that these phenomena can constitute a direct physical threat to national security. We firmly believe that the, there is no uh, residuum, if that's uh, of the cases. Bottom line is, the bottom line is what this, uh, this document is really about. We suggest that this aim may be achieved by integrated program assigned to reassure the public of a total lack of evidence of uh, 
What does that say? Uh, Something forces behind the phenomena. Of a, the total lack of evidence of in, in something, yeah, in, in something, blah, 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 I can't. Uh, yeah, uh, but the, so it's, that's their debunking line. So we've read all these other documents where they're not sure what some objects are. They're in the vicinity of important installations. So that line doesn't make any sense. So obviously, <laughs> well, you this, know, like their cover, their, their aim is to, to lie to the public, basically. Well, and, and check this out. In light of this conclusion, the panel recommends that the national security agencies take immediate steps to strip the unidentified flying objects of the special status they have been given <laughs> mm -hmm. and the aura of mystery they have unfortunately uh, uh, acquired. Which was all because of them. <laughs> you know, there's mystery because they lied about sightings and weren't up front with what was happening as, as we can see, you know. Okay. Now you sent me some PDFs earlier. Is this, I'm sorry, uh, some JPEGs. Is this, is this one that went into one of your PDFs? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well maybe I'm not sure actually, but this is a great one because again, here we are the flag saucer sightings on a geographical basis showed them, um, something frequent in the vicinity of atomic energy installations. And look what it says there, maybe because of the greater security consciousness of persons in those areas. That's the exact same thing that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick says about his sightings map. It could be, maybe it's not really a hotspot, it's just because there's more people paying attention, basically. You know, They were saying the same thing in 1952. So how is it okay for us to go through all this, start up Aero, you know, do all these reports, these congressional hearings, just to tell us the same stuff as they did in 1952. <laughs> you know? yeah. Like taxpayers should be, if you're not pissed about him actually being honest, be pissed about them wasting taxpayer money on giving us a 1952 blue book study, you know, because that's what they're doing. Well, I'm looking at this part here. Um, where they're complaining. Also, you see that 20% have not been explained primarily. Mm -hmm. of the vague descriptions they say so actually in the same year in air force files um uh, edward rupelt actually put together like kind of this little st summer study or whatever where he went through everything he was the main guy who studied ufos for the air force and i actually have this in an article on my website but he states that only seven percent of objects seven percent of objects could be positively identified, meaning they only knew for sure what 7% of the objects actually were. The rest was, well, sounds like it's round and, and is moving, you know, with the wind. So that's, that's a balloon or, you know, planes are seen here sometimes. So we'll call it a plane. How can you really go out and tell the public and give them these numbers with a straight face? When you could only say for sure what seven percent of the objects were. Well, this is this isn't yeah exactly. And this is interesting too. Uh, key members of some of these uh, UFO societies, which have been instrumental in keeping the flying saucer craze before the public, have been exposed as being of doubtful loyalty. That sounds like uh, I think they're a bunch of commies that were doing this. Uh, they uh, some some did some did think that for sure. Furthermore, these societies in some cases are financed from an unknown source. The Air Force realizes that a public-made jumpy by the flying saucer scare would be a serious liability in the event of air attacks by an enemy. Wow. It, it's true, but not the, the one truth to it is they, like Russia, if Russia somehow found a way to, actually Japan did this with um, something called Fugo balloons where they threw them over the, let them go over the ocean and they came over our country, right? And they kind of confused us and maybe they'd ping a radar or something like that. And so like if there's a wartime atmosphere and they're sending all these fake targets out there, yeah, that would, that would be a problem, you know, but it's also not realistic with what the, the real issue was Got at it. the time. All right. Yeah. So here's one, this is another one that you, uh, that you sent, uh, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, I thought this was interesting because this comes from an OSI 
CIA uh, study that was done before the Robertson panel in late summer of 1952, just about a couple weeks after the DC sightings. And, you know, it's interesting because it says many are on scientific frontiers, which have as yet been little explored or charted. In these areas occur phenomena which may account for optical or electronic aberrations, as well as for things actually seen. They listed three categories, atmospheric, ionization, and extraterrestrial, with the dash in between, phenomena. They suggested also that products of nuclear fission, fission might have some effect upon these. And what's interesting is um, a scientist for... Um, Somebody came out and said that in the news in a newspaper article, and someone from the Atomic Energy Commission rebutted that in a newspaper article um, a few days after. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Here's another one that uh, that you sent. Yeah, this uh, this actually kind of centers around a bunch of sightings that are from like 1949 to about 1950, 51 where there there was a lot of ufos over los alamos sandia um oak ridge and other places in um southwestern uh, us and some of them actually had a rise in background radiation when the ufos were seen this happened at oak ridge where a nuclear aircraft propulsion engineer actually did that and found that there was a rise in radiation and correlated it with uh, sightings picked up at the airport in town. At Los Alamos, actual Los Alamos scientists um, did their own little thing <laughs> and measured a radiation spike as UFOs went by. And also at the Mount Palomar Observatory in California, where a Navy guy was there, multiple Geiger counters went off. They even actually did a test flight to see if the plane would make the Geiger counters go off, and it did not. Wow. Um, and then, yeah, so af after that, it kind of gets dark. But it's interesting because, again, it's in, all in, like, 1952, a lot of this took place, 1949, 1950, you know, and they have this press conference with Sanford in 1952 where it's all about those sightings. And meanwhile, they have no idea that these scientists are picking up Right, you know, rise in uh, radiation and sightings, and they're interested in it. It's, it's pretty wild. Wow. Yeah, but yeah. Well, and what's interesting is most of this, the bulk of this, seems to be out of fifty two, fifty three. That's a sure. lot of uh, mm -hmm. years following that that we don't have any data. So you know that the CIA was uh, yeah. up to oh, shenanigans yeah. uh, then. Okay, here's another one that that uh, you sent: uh, radar phantoms. Wow. Yeah, so number number four is uh, on here to, you know, not bore people, I guess. I'll just get to the meat of it. Uh, naturally, there is general concern uh, about the radar phantoms, the larger problem of the flying saucers, because we're unable to explain a sizable percentage of the reports. We are unable to explain a sizable percentage of reports. Um, however, the consensus seems to be that a great deal of activity and study is going on in this field, which will do much to clarify the situation. Um, and then they go into anomalous radar propagation. So the, the anomalous radar propagation, all the good cases, you know, most of the good cases that come with actual radar data, photos of the radar plots in the Air Force files, um, they call it anomalous propagation. These are things that go 90 degree turns, 3000 miles per hour, everything that we hear about flag saucers. The reason why that doesn't stack up is because there were actual visual sightings at the same time. <laughs> but what they would do is they would separate those and they would debunk one at a time. And they said, okay, the visual we'll say was Venus and the radar hit was anomalous propagation. <laughs> wow. You know, and they've done that at nuclear bases and, and just other, you know, Air Force pilot cases and uh, Navy cases. So, yeah. All right, here's another one from you here. Oh, yeah, here we go. That's uh, number four again. So it's towards the bottom. Sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes, traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations. Oh, we already did this one. Oh, this is one we did. Okay. Yeah. Let's see here. Yeah. Uh, 
it's worthy of a repeat, I guess. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did we do this one? Yeah, I thought this was interesting because they were talking about uh, this, the Soviets in here, you know, and we hear about the Cold War and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So determination of scientific capabilities of the Soviets to create and control flying saucers as a weapon against the United States is a primary uh, concern of the CIA. Then they say its review of existing information does not lead to the conclusion that the saucers are USSR created or controlled. A lot of people you'll see out there will talk about, oh, those, those saucers were German secret projects and, and then the Soviets took over them and they had the flying saucers. Well, here you can see that, that they're saying uh, we have nothing to back that up. And then, you know, they're obviously curious down in those bullet points. Um, what the Soviets know about it. <laughs> right. What are the possible Soviet capabilities to utilize these phenomena mm -hmm. to the de detriment of U.S. security interests? Interesting, uh, huh? Yeah, and then also what effect do flying saucers have on our warning uh, system? Uh, yeah, you know, and it says here, for the major scientific intelligence problems in respect to saucers are, I mean, that just completely spells it out. Sure. And they're and, also like talking about these unidentified like tracks too. Like if the Soviets had the capability to put a somehow put some weird track in a fighter jet's radar or something, you know, that could be confusing. So I think they may be hinting at that too. And I, I really do think they're, that's a little bit of part of it because the CIA actually wound up doing something called uh, Project Palladium, where they were in Cuba, sent identified unidentified tracks into a, a Soviet jet and put a balloon in the air. <laughs> it tried screwed with them. Yeah, so. Wow. Okay, here we go. Uh, next one. This one is interesting. So this is uh, proof uh, CIA was classified top secret, 1952. Uh, oh, we looked at this one already. We yeah. did. Okay, sorry. It's all yeah. kind of... Uh, That's okay. Let's see. Uh, let's this see. one too, I think. Yeah. Uh, da -da. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, let's this... get let's get back to. Um, so we did the Hoover one, and then let's uh, go to this guy here. So that one, one yeah, we looked at that one. We did do that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Da -da. We do this one? Mm -hmm. Can't keep them all straight. Uh, my Let's see here. Uh, yeah. Okay. We did. Oh, you know what? I probably just went the wrong way. CIA still studies saucers? Oh, there we go. See, so that's kind of playing off the one that you had for 1953 that we saw. Well, it's so Mm hmm. So then look, look at, uh, yeah, these bullet points. Uh, a files will be maintained ASD on incoming raw reports where in our judgment the subject matter may provide information bearing on foreign weapon systems research or development like maybe the Soviets mm -hmm. reverse engineering their own sauce <laughs> right and uh, yeah reports do not fit any of the it's, uh, file yeah that's a pretty file good. of a file of finished intelligence reports published by members of the United States intelligence community will be maintained in ASD. What do you know what ASD is? Um, I can't think of what it is right now. I don't. I think it just is the same kind of physics and electronics branch. But again, yeah, they put non-conventional types of air vehicles. And that was kind of one thing I wish would have been in the... Uh, the UAPDA because they put different words in there, mm -hmm. you know, flag saucer on a UFO or this or that, but they didn't put that. And having seen these files before, I, I thought it was really important to put unconventional object or non-conventional air vehicle because that's what the CIA was using as we see here, you know? Right. So if you're not using those terms and they don't want you to have the records, do you think they're going to say, oh, you didn't use this term, but we'll give you these anyways? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. 
notes. Here's, uh, let's see, this one's, oh, okay. So this, this is gonna take some digging into. Um, so this apparently is not very, well, I think there was a, a subreddit about it, but it, it did not get the attention it deserves is what one source told me and that we needed to pay attention to this one. So do you wanna walk us yeah, through, this is, uh, this is a, uh, I think it's 52 pages long uh, from uh, the Australian uh, National Archives, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, uh, really interesting. First, first of all, you see here, they're mentioning Dr. Valet, Jacques Valet, which mm. is, which is pretty interesting. But yeah, what I got from these, yeah, what I got from these documents is they were giving their synopsis on what the CIA was doing with the UFO stuff, right? And you get an inside look at what the CIA was really doing because Australia had their own intelligence, you know? They weren't civilians looking at this. So oh, before you go too far. Okay, go ahead. Um, I think it was, yeah. So intelligence aspects include assessment of real from false reporting capabilities of propulsion methods and possible weapons used. I think that's pretty interesting. That is. And it gets more interesting as we, as we go on. Okay, let me make sure I had that first. Okay, so that's the first one. We'll go on to the second page here. Yeah, so that's pretty good for research. So it's interesting here because they give you a little context on who OSI CIA is, right? Because all the documents we looked at were OSI handles this, OSI handles this. And I didn't know until actually reading this because I haven't spent a whole lot of time. But at that time, OSI was responsible for intelligence on foreign research and development in nuclear and missile matters. And that's important because of the nuclear connection to the UFO. And then they year. talk about debunking UFOs, you know, See, I erecting alarmed. a facade of ridicule. Well, let's uh, step through this. Uh, so, yeah, as a means of, uh, see, I became alarmed with the car. overloading, uh, acting through Robertson panel meeting, uh, persuaded the U.S. Air Force to use Project Blue Book as a means to publicly debunk UFOs and at a later stage to allocate funds for the Avro Advanced Saucer Aircraft. To initiate such programs decades ahead of normal scientific development would indicate the U.S. government acknowledged the existence of advanced Wait. aircraft. I think you, you skipped a good one. To initiate such programs decades... Wait, no, no. Uh, Is it up? Avro me? Advanced Saucer Aircraft and the launching of crash programs into anti-gravity power. Oh, wow. I did miss that. In and, well, is yeah, so it's, so they're Avro talking Advanced about saucer air. Yeah, so they're talking about crash retrievals, right? I'm not sure if it's crash retrievals. They say crash program into anti gravity power. They were tra they were working on anti gravity <laughs> propulsion, you know. And this is what uh, what do we say? This was 1971. Um, but they're talking about yeah 1953, which is during the time the documents were made that we read from uh, from the CIA, which so is so it's by, interesting. By erecting a, a facade of ridicule, the U.S. hoped to allay public alarm, reduce the possibility of Soviet taking advantage of UFO mass sightings for either psychological or actual warfare purposes, and act as a cover for the real U.S. program of developing vehicles that emulate UFO performances. Wow. <laughs> yeah, pretty interesting. The RAF. Yeah, so I mean, go ahead. They're yeah, pretty much saying they using a UFO program to to cover up a program of making a UFO. Right. <laughs> but ever since the UFO reports started coming in from the Air Force, one of the first things, one of the first studies they they did, uh, they contracted with the Rand Corporation, who was really a, just another project of the Air Force at that time, to see what it would take for another life form to actually travel here from a different planet. So what kind of propulsion would you need? What kind of materials would you need? How long would it take? How likely is it? And that's online in the archives. But um, so, but from that, what I gathered is from the very start, they were trying to make something that could do what UFOs did. Right. Wow. So uh, let's see here. Uh, the conclusion Which of the condemnation. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, the conclusions of the Condon report conflict with its own contents and has been discredited by many reputable scientists, including UFO scientific consultant to the U.S. Air Force. Um, yeah, so I just highlighted the things that were pretty interesting to me. So if you want to talk about two here. Uh, yeah, so February 1949, Edic Personnel and Project Sign. So this is the time I was just talking about with Rand. Replace new personnel to form Project Grudge. A definite attempt was made in 49 to use Grudge to destroy any acceptance of UFOs. The motives are not clear. Possibly Air Force embarrassment at being incapable. Remember the 7% positively mm -hmm. identified? Of being incapable of controlling the situation and or a fear of national panic. I mean, could you imagine if, you know, all these reports were going off and, and they were honest with you and said, actually, I can only say for sure what 7% of these are. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? No idea what the rest of it is. I don't think that would go well. Yeah, no, pro it probably, probably wouldn't. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, so continuing there. And they just say the government agency was not the FBI uh, and the rocket nuclear intelligence experts. Their purpose was to study UFO reports in an effort to gather design data on interplanetary spaceships. Wow. In the light of yeah, this document, wow. I'm telling you, is, is a is a home run. <laughs> and I just read it today from you. Wow. I mean, I looked at the Australian files before. Um, but I don't remember seeing this one. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. A, uh, a, a contact. But it spells out everything. Yeah. No, a, 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 a long contact I've had in the intelligence community sent me this and said, this needs to get uh, attention and it's not getting it. And, yeah. And, I would uh, say. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So we've got that. Um, Three it, tells you, it tells you the truth behind everything we were just looking at. That's what the see it like. A lot of times what I call FOIA documents are, uh, I call them press releases. That's what right. they want you to see, you know, even though there's a lot of documents, you know, it, it, there's a lot of very, um, you know, um, blurry documents where they don't really tell you anything. It's all very middle road, nothing to see here, you know? Right. But you get these little hints that we see, you know, right. where they can't attribute it to anything. But then you see the Australian take that we're looking at. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so, right. so that is what they were really doing because they weren't really guessing. They were saying this is what the CIA is doing. And, you know, Project Blue Book and the Air Force was just up front to make it look stupid. While the CIA tried to find out how the UFOs moved, how they did. And design it themselves. Okay, here's uh, next yeah. uh, interesting page. This is uh, huge. Yeah, if you want to talk about seven there. Well, here it talks about the tightened by the issuing of JANEP 146. So JANEP 146 was actually, um, I forget when NORAD started. I don't think it was in 53, but um, NORAD wound up using JANEP 146 for UFO reports. So um, you know, Canada and, and the USA report things through NORAD and they would fill out a JANF 146. So what they're saying here is in 1953, which prohibited service personnel from discussing UFOs by threatening defaulters with up to 10 years in jail or $10,000 fine. You want wow. to keep people quiet. And when you look at the files during that time, there are like uh, Graham Rendell writes amazing books on these documents in the actual sightings that were happening then air force pilot sightings and you know those were never in the papers you know there's some here and there made it in the paper but a lot of them nobody knows about and they're just sitting in the archives so, and that's so, a hint at why that is <laughs> yeah so, so basically what it's 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 laying out that air force personnel that discuss ufos are threatened with 10,000 years in, or 10 years in jail and a $10,000 fine. Yeah. The 10, 10 uh, program. <laughs> when, uh, when personnel are resigned or retired, however, it was possible to reveal us air force attitudes. Uh, and this way, many intelligence officers associated with the UFO problem, including major Fournay at project blue yeah. book. Um, so he, he's a 
Fournette's actually very interesting because he actually ran uh, most of the Blue Book studies during that time. Okay. And in the Robertson panel, Fournette actually presented his case that these were interplanetary spaceships. Um, and the CIA in the documents blew them off. So. The change in the style of U.S. Air Force reporting. Let's see. What, uh, although biased yeah. in favor of natural totally. explanation. Section was that? That's... Totally. So they're saying... They're saying what we were already saying, like uh, in 1952, all the documents, CIA documents that we looked at, this was all, all that smoke was them setting up the debunking thing and giving the real stuff to the CIA. Of course, back then they didn't have uh, uh, debunkers on Twitter to employ, so. Uh... Right. Yeah, they had Philip Class or whatever. Right. It, you know, they come out with like a debunking newspaper article. And it's funny when you read those because it's it's such a delayed version of what we see on Twitter, right? Because there's <laughs> one know. article that comes out by Kehoe and then like a month later comes out the debunking one. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. so slow. Uh, let's see here. Um, da -da. Let's see, and do preponderance scanners, assuming that no ast no astronomical objects were left in the unknowns. Uh, talks about Project Blue Book, Avro. Okay, so I uh, want to talk about 14 here. Here we, yeah, here we go again. A more astounding decision on the part of the U.S. government was to allocate considerable funds to investigate gravity and a means of controlling gravity. Anti-gravity. <laughs> craft propulsion right. despite the fact that science had not attained a level of competence to deal with either gravity or anti-gravity problems and the only theory that might be applicable was einstein's unified field theory which was still incomplete at the time of his death the u.s chose to support six universities six universities and government agencies in an all-out drive to conquer the problem of anti-gravity it is significant that at this time the current theories on ufo propulsion for a mixture of gravity control and electromagnetic propulsion. Uh, guess what? Nobody knew that. <laughs> you know, that wow. They, that they, six universities for an all out anti gravity propulsion study. That is pretty crazy. That, that is, uh, that is crazy. Now, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's I've see. looked at old documents for a long time now, and I've never seen. I've never seen those. The one thing I found was called something Project Winter Haven in 1953, where the Carnegie Institute actually sponsored it. Uh -huh. And they were all um, doing like um, advanced propulsion. Anti-gravity was a part of that. Mm -hmm. Townsend Brown was a part of it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but also yeah. SRI, where Hal Pudoff came from and Russell Targ. In 19, before they were there, obviously, it was in the 50s, but they took part in it too. So. Wow. That, that could have been what they're talking about, but I don't know. Okay. Scientists included uh, Teller. Go. So T Teller, that's Edward Teller. He was the f uh, the father of the thermonuclear bomb um, mm -hmm. from University of California. So if, yeah, if you want to, con uh, so Oppenheimer. Wow. Well, yeah. So this is what David Rush says. <laughs> and uh, also Lockheed Martin, I mean, he says the, the security of the Manhattan Project, people that were part of the Manhattan Project were a part of this, right? And there's no documentation from our government that says this. So it takes this Australian government look at what we're doing to reveal this. The scientists involved include Teller, Oppenheimer, Dyson, Dyson Spheres, um, J.A. Wheeler, um, and Richard Arnowit of Princeton, um, Stanley Dyser. The objective was to control gravity. During 55, the following firms entered into gravity or electromagnetic programs. Glenn L. Martin. So that's before they merged with Lockheed. So it's Lockheed Martin. Um, and other Bell Aircraft, Convair. Yeah. This pretty, is interesting. Pretty crazy. Yeah, this is interesting here, 17. Such an intensive onslaught on the gravity enigma was entirely irrational from the standpoint of conventional science and can only be rationalized within the context of mm -hmm. a firm belief that UFOs were real and that the intelligences behind them knew how to control gravity. The drive to harness this power before, uh, uh, the drive to harness this power before the USSR could 
uh, do so would be a strong incentive for the U.S. government to fully support an anti-gravity program. By 1966, wow. 46 separate projects of this nature wow. were being finance, uh, financially supported, 33 of which were under wow. the supervision of the U.S. Air Force. <laughs> no wonder the Air Force lies about this all the time. <laughs> Jeez. That is incredible. It's yeah. an amazing document, dude. By 1966, 46 separate projects, 33 were under the uh, supervision of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, although, I mean, no wonder Kathy Hicks uh, wants to classify all these special access program as, as waived so she, she can filter all kinds of- What are they doing of, now? Yeah, billions of dollars to the Air Force uh, of our taxpayer yes. money, by the way. I don't think any of the taxpayers knew that their money was going to fund no. 44 anti-gravity propulsion programs. That's, no. Yeah, that's that's okay. Anyway, Crazy. continue continuing Best here. Best document I've seen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, although details of most of these projects have been kept classified, it would appear that generally they have not been successful. Work on gravitational waves by Jay Weber and his associates under U.S. Air Force Cambridge Research uh, Laboratory uh, jurisdiction has been reported fairly extensively. Um, oh, that's interesting. Wow. Okay. So let's see. Interesting. Here. Um, Work on gravitational waves. We just heard something about that. I wish I had the the link, but uh, let's see. Slips uh, my mind. And I, you know, I'm kind of going through this at the same time. Let's see here. Uh, let's see, see. Yeah, that. I mean, that document kind of affirms all the suspicions. Now, did I think one of the ones that um, I'm supposed to look at here? was pointed to, I just got to find it here real quick, um, a certain page. Uh, let's see. Da -da. Sorry about that. Yeah, that document needs to go on News Nation ASAP. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, you want the proof? <laughs> okay, hold on one second. So seven. All right, hold on one second, guys. Sorry, we're kind of struggling through this here. So... Yeah, there was there was one where it talks about like the different kinds of witnesses, citing yes. reliability, excellent. Thirty three point three percent are unknown. Jump to page seven. Pretty good, but okay. that's not fair to what we just looked at. It's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's see. I pop this up here. Oops. Sorry, it's really yeah, I think we finished the, the good stuff I had on that one. Well, I think I was pointed to some additional pages that you didn't have. So I'm trying to oh, okay. those. Cool. Uh, so, okay. The early analysis of UFO reports by U.S. Air Force Intelligence indicated that real phenomena were being reported, which had flight characteristics so far in advance of U.S. aircraft that yeah. only an extraterrestrial origin could be envisaged, en envisaged. A government agency, which later events indicated to be the CIA Office of Scientific uh, Intelligence, OSI, studied the UFO reports. Uh, uh, so UFO reports Determining the, the UFO propulsion methods. Yeah, wow. of, uh, at that time, OSI was responsible for intelligence on foreign research. The CIA, be number two, the CIA became alarmed at the overloading of military communications during the mass sightings of 1952 and considered the possibility that the USSAR may take advantage of the situation. As a result, OSI acting through the Robertson panel meeting of January persuaded the U.S. Air Force to use Project Blue Book as a means of publicly debunking UFOs. Um, I think the modern oh, day ver the I think the modern day version yeah. of, of that would be uh, Project Mc Arrow. Project Mick West, um, yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and and at a later <laughs> stage to allocate funds for Avro. Uh, for, yes, we talked about the saucer uh, three well, by. You know, that's actually a really good point. You know, and I've said this before that mm -hmm. like uh, the people that really are out there debunking this stuff. You know, pick your poison, whoever you want. Um, you'll notice a couple things. One, they don't push for transparency. You know, they don't want to be able to officially prove you wrong or they would, you know, so they're just complaining. And um, and yeah, that's that's really the main thing is they only care about trying to make you feel stupid for believing in any of it. And you can feel that through their 
their banter, you know, and the fact that they don't push for more transparency themselves. Yeah. And so cool. to me, they should be allowed in the conversation. Then, you know? I, I agree. What's funny is, is so, so uh, Mark von Rennenkamp, who, who writes, uh, writes opinion pieces for the Hill, very smart guy, comes from national security yeah. background. Uh, he has been all over proving the Tic Tac case and debunking Mick West's uh, <laughs> arguments, Mick West being a former video game developer. So, Mm-hmm. So finally, when um, when when Marek, when, when, I've seen Mick do this twice. When he realizes he he has lost his argument, he either changes the subject altogether or he just blocks sure. somebody on Twitter. So he blocked Marek. Yeah. I've actually replied to Mick West's post saying, "Hey, you know, Mark's a nice guy. You're a nice guy." <laughs> You both have interesting points. Why don't you unblock Marek and in, in, and engage yeah. in a thoughtful discussion on this? Let's and figure Mick, it out. Yeah, yeah, just figure it out. We're all big boys here <laughs> and big girls. And of course, Mick West, he won't touch it because he he, ah. know, he knows he's been caught. He knows he's been caught. Uh, the same yeah. thing, if you go back, there was one interview that Mick West did with um, with uh, Lou Elizondo and and Lou finally backed him into a corner to prove Mick was wrong, and Mick like turned on a dime to change the subject. I mean, the the, the jig is up. I mean, we we know what this guy's up to. I, you know, as I always right. say, it's like if you if like if Sean, if you if you believed in the Loch Ness monster and you had a podcast about it or whatever, mm-hmm. and you're like trying to convince me about the Loch Ness monster and I think it's all BS, I'd be like, Sean, man, you know, I'm gonna go have a beer and, and hang out with my kids or whatever, yeah. go knock yourself out, do your Twitter thing, talk about Loch Ness <laughs> Monster all you want. Yeah. The last thing I exactly. would do is spend mm-hmm. the most valuable your commodity that we all have, which is time <laughs> to spend hours on end. There's this other guy named Paranormal mm-hmm. Chris. He's, he's now rebranded himself as some UA. Uh, <laughs> uh, rebranded. Uh, yeah, he, he rebrand, a, a rebranded. Rebranded the expert. bunker. Yeah, rebranded the bunker. But he's another one of these guys that is clearly on on the payroll and then you have the other guy that that works in uh in the basement of rupert murdoch's uh, uh fox outfit anyway i digress <laughs> let's keep going here um yeah uh number three by erecting a facade of ridicule the u.s uh, hoped to allay public affairs reduce the possibility of the soviet uh, taking advantage oh, of we, UFO yeah, we read this already we read that yeah. one okay so then what mm-hmm. is so, okay, I'm gonna do seven we uh, what it? we read was like seven, eight, nine, and ten, okay. I think. Or Did something. we read five? That's what I picked. No. Okay. Yeah. So with so this is the other one. Uh, uh, or I mean, no. Um, yeah. You did read not. this? No. Okay. I don't would think it, so. Would appear wrong for Australia to remain ignorant of the true situation. We lack an intelligence viewpoint that can assess the nature and possible consequences of the problem. A scientific viewpoint that could derive scientifically uh, valid uh, data from the reports and the public relations uh, view, uh, viewpoint that can honestly satisfy public interest. To overcome these deficiencies in the Australian investigation of UFOs, it would seem that a strong case exists for the acceptance of the RAAF suggestion that another government department assume responsibility for the investigation and analysis of UFO reports. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, we should ask, why don't you feel that way now? Yeah. <laughs> don't you think it's irresponsible to not look at this seriously? Yeah. I mean, you did then. Obviously, there's stuff going on. I mean, it, don't you watch the news? <laughs> it's, yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm just kind of skipping through some other things here. I'll I'll pop it up, and if you see... I'll try not to go through all 58 pages, but um, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's uh, summer of 1952 saw more than 20 fold uh, rise increase in the normal reported rate and included two extensive July, July sightings involving Washington, D.C. This marked increase in sightings had diverse effects. A component of the U.S. Air Force intelligence considered that you. Oh, wow. This is insane. A component of U.S. Air Force intelligence considered that UFOs were interplanetary spaceships, spaceships. which were about to make closer contact. Yes. I'm glad you didn't forget that. 
that mm-hmm. to prepare the public for the for this possibility, 41 previously classified reports were released for publication between 1951, 1953. These reports contradicted the earlier U.S. Air Force policy of disseminating the reports as misidentifications. On the other hand, the CIA regarded the summer UFO activity as a threat to national security, mainly because the resulting crowded communications and defense involvement. Wow. Mm-hmm. No yeah. wonder. Uh, no wonder. And that's that probably was... that Fournette guy was talking about. You know that the the group inside the Air Force that legitimately thought these were interplanetary. Yeah, and that they're about to make close contact. That's that's pretty wild. So we're gonna. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go through. Uh, I know we we're running long, and if you need to run to the restroom or something, go for it. But I, I want to go through this whole document now that okay. I'm yeah. seeing that there's uh, a HBO lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, control of the public awareness of the UFO situation was tightened. Did this one, by, yeah. Yeah, do we read this one? Yeah, the $10,000 okay. fine. Mm-hmm. Okay, we did. We, I had all these same pages, but I only highlighted like a couple things. Got so. it. Okay. And again, this is yeah, from the National one, Arc. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say that was, that was a great piece that you caught on that. Uh, that page about the are some people in the Air Force thinking interplanetary spaceships. Yeah, well, and meanwhile they're, they're making you know the civilians or whatever feel stupid for thinking that and and just making fun of it while people in their own you know military branch think that. Yeah. So now you have the you know now they have the debunkers that uh, that can do that, and I'm sure I'm quite sure they're on the payroll yeah. of somebody. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Throughout the years of UFO phenomena, there has been a persistent form of official pronouncements which state that the percentage of unknowns would be reduced if more data were available. Uh, reports, uh, let's see, introduction. Now, how interesting is that? Because that's the same thing that NASA and Kirkpatrick blame the whole thing on. We don't have enough data. We just don't have the right data. And we've just proved that they were very aware of the same thing back in the 50s. So you're telling me all the way from then, when you said you didn't have enough data, all the way till now, 2023, you still don't have enough data on so, a 70, 80 year problem? Get real. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so essentially this, this is laying out the, the game plan of what Arrow and NASA has said. Sure. It's, they're, they're just yeah. doing the same stuff same over stuff. again. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. And a part of that is taking uh, sightings or videos, you know, uh, and taking the mystery and then explaining it in prosaic terms. That's actually in the playbook, you know. So, and that's what people do. They take something that initially is mysterious, like Mick West and a UFO video, and then describes it as something prosaic. Right when really either side can't be proved by just looking at the video. (laughs) So it's like, what are you guys yelling about? A more astounding, this is interesting, 14, a more astounding decision on the part of the U.S. government was, did we we read that one? Read it. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Let's see. Next one. Yeah, man. Um, Let's see. Any of this? And they go into the universities. Roger Babson. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology through Rob Roger Babson Gravity Research Institute. So why that's interesting is this guy named Townsend Brown um, worked with him at that institute. And at that time, and I have the documents on my website, SeanRosh.com, of Townsend Brown finding anomalous material. Hmm. Um, and it was like gravitationally anomalous material. <clears throat> so that kind of puts that together as uh, them working together on this and probably with that uh, material, it was believed to make a gravity motor, a gravity differential was required, which necessitate, necessitated the discovery of an insulator, deflector or absorber of gravity. By 55, 485 essays had been written on this subject and awards totaling, well, that's not much, 10,800 bucks. Maybe that's a lot then. <laughs> and here again, the U.S. Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratory comes up. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, they're interesting to me because, um, there was something called the project twinkle in like 1949 went to like 1951. Mm -hmm. And that was just all about these specific phenomena called green fireballs okay. um, that were seen all over the installations, Los Alamos, Sandia, like uh, hundreds of them by the atomic energy commission guards at these places would make the reports most of the time. Mm -hmm. And they're green fireballs that would just travel this way. So they, they weren't meteors. And they had a big meeting about it with Edward Teller and a uh, Dr. La Paz, who is a meteorics guy at the University of New Mexico. Um, and where they stopped was not being able to explain what they were, mm -hmm. and that Cambridge was going to take over the study of the green fireballs, and documentation on it ceases to exist after that. Wow. So. Uh now, this is interesting. Colorado Project became uh, discredited when Dr. Condon stated publicly that uh, my attitude right now is that there's nothing to it, but I'm not supposed to reach a conclusion for another year. The revealing of a memorandum outlining a method to trick the public combined with a general dissatisfaction at Condon's biased attitude led to the dismissal and resignation of most of the staff after most of the investigations had been made up but uh, not completely written up. The final report of 965 mm -hmm. pages lacked coherence. Condon's conclusions, this is interesting, were at variance with the individual staff conclusions, although only Condon's conclusions were publicized. So in other words, well. the staff, Condon did his thing and the staff realized it was all real. <laughs> that's, that's As anyone were looking at the cases, right? Yeah. Like, that's what, that's why I'm still here is because I actually looked at all those cases, all the actual files, and you can't say that there's nothing going on. It's impossible right. if, if you actually uh, read those. It's so, the, uh, as a result I'm of the Condon surprised. report. Uh, U.S. Air Force closed down Project Blue Book shortly after, uh, shortly before American Association for the Advancement of Science held a special meeting to counteract the effect of the Condon Report. Wow. Um, and then here yeah. it talks about uh, J. Allen Hynek. More part-time officer. I looked at that. Uh, Admits that interest lies solely in air defense. Uh, yeah, some of the Commonwealth, scrolling through here. Uh, it talks about Venus in general. It's been, uh, uh, RAFF attitude has been guided by the U.S. Air Force public releases, which were aimed at allaying public interest by denying the reality of UFOs. <laughs> Freaking Air Force mm -hmm. again, man. <laughs> you can't trust it. Yeah, no, no, go. Can't trust what Kirk they say. Kirkpatrick wrote a paper recently that he put yeah. out on this stuff, and it's basically a blue book report. So if anybody's watching this and they're interested, go read that after what we're looking at right now, and you tell me if you have faith in Arrow and if you're a whistleblower, if you'd go to them. I sure. I, no. We already told. <laughs> we, we already t we sent people to a, a senator's office. We told them not to go to Arrow. Uh, there you go. Okay. Interesting. Uh, 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 releases uh, guided by U.S. Air Force public releases, which were aimed at allaying public interest by denying the reality of UFOs. Consequently, most of the Australian reports were given identifications without a great concern for rational correlation. Most investigators and collectors regarded the UFOs tasks as an intrusion into more legitimate tasks. Uh, okay. If Australia is to follow the U.S. lead instead of following the public U.S. Air Force attitude, it would be preferable to follow the U.S. Air Force CIA role of concentrating on gaining a knowledge of the power sources involved. In other words, <laughs> they, want to, they want to know what we the figured aliens. out about how they work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, be preferable to follow the U.S. Air Force CIA. However, it may be preferable to act independently of the U.S. and to initiate a program that is scientifically sound and intellectually honest towards unraveling the UFO mystery. In such a venture, it may be worthwhile working somewhat closer to the public than as usual. Wow. Uh, what are these? Oh, and they're just going through the, the history. Are these all uh, 
a secret report. It's, yeah, like kind of history. Was the rest of it uh, like this, or if we started to... mm -hmm. this? What this will deserve a, a full like sitting with and it once over. But I think we went over the amazing stuff. <laughs> I don't see how it could get much more. Uh, oh, William Lear, look at that. Two, 255. William P. Lear, chairman of Lear Incorporated, Santa Monica, stated that because of flying saucers, serious efforts were being made in the U.S. to prove the existence of anti gravitational forces. Wow. William Lear is the father of John Lear. Okay. Who. Um, did some pretty big interviews with George Knapp, um, and he was a pilot for the CIA. I do remember hearing that. Um, yeah, and he, what he would talk about was a lot more out there than I could get with. It was about mm -hmm. like stuff on the bases on the moon, beings on the moon. I mean, I have no idea, but that's what he would get into. Uh, but he talked a lot about the cover up and all that kind of stuff. So it's interesting to know that his father was interested, you know. So this here's some more interesting stuff here. Inspector General of Air Force circulates classified, quote, UFOs serious business in an effort to stimulate and improve the reporting of UFOs. Investigating officers are to be equipped with Geiger counters as well as cameras, binoculars. Sure. Now, this is. Dot 60 here, mm -hmm. uh, JANAP 146E invo invokes espionage laws to prevent the revealing of UFO data. Yeah, that's that's your $10,000 right there. U.S. Uh, recommends that Project Blue Book, uh, let's see, anything more here? I mean, we just saw that it costs like $10,000 for a crap ton of different studies. So that must have been a good amount to them. And then they're going to find somebody for talking about their UFO sighting. $10,000. We're going to make you pay for all of our anti-grav studies if you speak all right, out. So here, here we're exposing uh, more of the uh, U.S. Air Force uh, BS. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel George A. Ulrich, U.S. Air Force Assistant Air Cache of the U.S. Embassy, approached uh, with a request for UFO reports to be sent to the U.S., Lieutenant Colonel Ulrich stated that the U.S. is very interested in UFO reports from all over the world, despite the official U.S. viewpoint that UFOs are the result of misidentification, hysteria, or hoaxes. Sightings details were requested to be signaled with photos, drawings, to follow by mail. Well, um, Deputy Chief of I'm Air Staff. I'm going to have to get rolling soon, just so you know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. I will, uh, you know what, what we can do is I can finish it off here and, um, we'll have you, we'll have okay. you back on. Perfect. Beautiful. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and thanks. You stop by my place too. What's that? You'll have to stop by my place too. I, I totally will. I'd be happy to come on, <laughs> come on your show. Uh, come on your show anytime. Uh, Sean, thanks cool. for joining us and, uh, I'll continue yeah, to you. go go through this uh, document here uh, solo, but, uh, okay. but uh, th thank you very much. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great document. So good luck with the rest of the show. Thanks for having me on. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So let's see here. Uh, I'll just kind of, kind of go through this as much as possible. Just want to make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, and again, all of this is from the national archives. Um, we talk about weapon systems here. Oh yeah, so here they're going into individual cases. Uh, this is oh, Jacques Vallée talking about uh, weapon systems, um, engines being turned off, uh, power systems being turned off by UFOs. Uh, let's see, uh, these are again more cases. Just gonna keep going through here. Uh, white egg shaped thing sounds like a tic tac. Okay, more of the same. And yeah, this just kind of looks like more cases. Let's keep going through this. Yeah, I think these are mostly cases here. 
Okay, yeah, radio TV interference. Just blaze through this. Uh, well, it's, 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 uh, wow, this talks to uh, about um, paralysis hypnosis devices. Uh, that if, uh, a man points a tube at Higgins uh, and then he receives some kind of electric shock as a ray hits him. And um, yeah, so this looks like they're talking about encounters with beings that, uh, you know, that paralyze them, you know, paralyze folks. Um, four to three foot being tree aimed a flashlight beam paralyzing the witness. I mean, this is extensive. Teenagers, as uh, talks about, uh, uh, again, men smaller than four feet uh, took a small tube from a container and pointed it at the person and paralyzed him for 20 minutes. And this is this is all from, um, you know, their the. The you know the Australia's Australia's version of the CIA essentially is what what we're talking about here. Um, again, uh, physical effects notes on uh, paralysis and and allied phenomenon car stalls, prickling uh, paralysis, strength of the effect. Let's see. Um, yep, we're just gonna keep going through this. We're almost to the end. It's just like uh, scanned documents uh, that were that were stamped. <clears throat> Sorry, internet is can be a little bit slow here. More of that. News release: Air Force to terminate. Uh, so that yeah, so that's uh, some uh, press uh, a press release there. On Project Blue Book, and let's see, it, uh, almost uh, forty-three out of fifty-eight. We're getting there. Flip size, more uh, sighting reports. Forty-six. Attaches a copy of a report by a, a captain. 48, okay. The more reports, uh, official reports with a, uh, this appears to be uh, some kind of naval report of an object that they encountered. It has the names of the people where the ship was I'm gonna to have to print this out. I, I, clearly, I I didn't have a chance. I got this thing so late yesterday, and uh, really didn't have a chance to dig into it. So, uh, so appreciate everyone kind of, uh, sort of uh, hanging hanging through there, hanging through this. Uh, more memos. We're almost to the end here. Reported sighting of falling object. Reported sighting of falling object. Yeah. So. These appear to be just kind of uh, official reports. Copy memorandum. It appears that's this. This could be to devote study to these reports. Um, okay, almost done. Let's see, this is kind of, again, talking about a report. Okay. Let's see, 57. Common weapons investigation reports. Oh, yeah, so this is uh, kind, of, kind of that. Okay. And I guess this is, uh, this is the box. Um, okay, so we're going to get on to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, other stuff here. Um, 
Okay. So, and I know this has all been very ad hoc and, and done in a, a very disorganized way, and my apologies for that. And uh, also, uh, thank you very much uh, to the folks that have uh, have uh, donated on the Super Chats. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, as, as you well know, nothing, uh, nothing in life is free, and these things uh, do cost money to make. And uh, it allows us, your financial support allows us to bring you great content like this and spend our time digging these sort of things up. And if you're not already a subscriber to our channel, we would certainly appreciate, uh, appreciate that. So um, what we're going to talk about next. So what David, what David Gresh was referring to uh, is a, a treaty that was negotiated under the uh, Richard Nixon administration. It was called the Accidental War Agreement. I'm going to uh, put put this up here. And as essentially, both sides under, understood, and I've been a, a student of US, uh, Russia and U.S. nuclear foreign policy really kind of since the 90s. Basically, both sides understood that the what had happened with the Cuban Missile Crisis, it, we came so, so close to a full-scale full uh, exchange in a nuclear war. Part of what they understood too, one of the points of failure that luckily didn't end up in, in a nuclear war, is the messaging that was going on between uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev was taking a, an inordinate amount of time to translate, actually up to a day. And that was what, what and, and this was before the hotline, this was actually what gave birth to the U.S.-Russia nuclear hotline. You'll hear them called uh, the red phone, uh, uh, thing, things of that nature. And um, so they came up with this communication system that was a, a, a you know, people think it's, it's just a, 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 back then it was just a, a telephone. It was actually a teletype uh, message because teletype, you could type it, there's no mis, um, misinterpreting of words uh, or, or whatnot. So in nuclear command and control, everything is built for speed, uh, speed so that you can respond to an in incoming threat. Um, you know, for instance, one thing that most people don't know is the president has absolute nuclear launch authority. He does not. A lot of people think that Secretary of Defense has to concur or the uh, there's a, a law of proportional use of force that if the president decides he wants to wake up and launch a nuclear strike, he can't do it. The reality of it is, and this was discussed heavily after Trump was out of office, was that the way our system is built for speed, the president can launch anything at any time as long, there are only two requirements. One, he has to confirm his identity uh, using a biscuit, uh, or it's a, a breakaway card in his, in his pocket. And then second, that the nuclear attack option is actually in the book. It's a pre-approved uh, attack option that he can select. So he can, he can do this at any time. So the point is, the way it's built that way and the way that there is no sort of backup to what the president does in, in that he has he can launch at any time he wants. It's built for speed so that if, if there is an incoming nuclear strike, the president can immediately, without needing concurrence of anyone else, launch, launch that strike. So with the, with the, with the, the, um, the, the, the hotline system, it's built with the same thing in mind. Communications has to be, has to be fast. So one of the things that they realized uh, the Nixon administration began to realize, and I think this may have actually preceded this a little bit, a little bit before, is that um, anything can trigger a nuclear war that is misinterpreted. So, so much in much in the same way that um, that you know that that this whole system is is built built for speed. Um, that is part of the problem. So when you when you have everything on a hair trigger alert that can literally, uh, uh, by a mistake, trigger a nuclear confrontation, that is that is indeed a um, you know that is indeed a, a a big problem. So and I'm just kind of scrolling through here, making sure uh, making sure we're still uh, still up. So. So when they designed this system, it was built for speed. And the part of the accidental war agreement, why it was crafted was to ensure that, um, 
that a mistake on either side did not cause an immediate massive exchange of nuclear weapons. So if, um, let's say that we launch, or say like, which is impossible to happen, but let's, let's say a rogue crew at a Minuteman ICBM silo launches a, um, you know, launches something. The part of the, the, this messaging system sent, can, you can send a message to, uh, to Russia that says a, a nuclear missile has been accidentally, uh, uh launched and we're not launching a full scale strike. This was a rogue thing. And, and that's, that's, uh, where that where that comes from so so anyway so the so they had this agreement uh, united states of america un, uh, and union of soviet socialist republics agreement on measures to reduce the risk of outbreak of nuclear war signed in washington september 30th 1971 and uh Essentially what it says, United States and Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, uh, taking into account the devastating consequences that nuclear war would have for all mankind, mankind and recognizing the need to exert every effort to avert the risk of outbreak of nuclear war, including measures to guard against accidental or unauthorized use of nuclear weapons. This is important here. Believing that the agreement on measures reducing the risk uh, of outbreak of nuclear war serves the interests of strengthening international peace, blah, blah, blah. So this is what they, what they, what this article or this, this nuclear treaty, what both sides uh, signed. Article one, each party undertakes to maintain and to improve as it deems necessary its existing organizational and technical arrangements to guard against the accidental or authorized, unauthorized use of nuclear weapon under its control. Article two, the parties undertake to notify each other immediately in the event of an accidental, unauthorized, or any unexplained incident, important, involving a possible detonation of a nuclear weapon which could create the risk of outbreak of nuclear war. In the event of such incidents, the party whose nuclear weapon is involved will immediately make every effort to take the necessary measures to render harmless or destroy such weapon without causing damage. Now we get to the good stuff. Article three, the parties undertake to notify each other immediately in the event of detection uh, by missile warning systems of unidentified objects or in the event of signs of interference with these systems by unidentified objects or with related communication facilities if such occurrence could create a risk of outbreak of nuclear war between countries. So the way our nuclear systems, our nuclear platforms are controlled is what's called uh, NC3, Nuclear Command and Control. That's NC3 is the acronym. And it is the, it starts at the top with the dissemination of a valid uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear, war or, nuclear war order from the president and through a, a system of various communications means uh, that, so in case of the president, he's at the White House, um, the guy that carries a nuclear football, he works for the White House military office. He comes in with the, with the football, opens it up, president opens this, this book that has uh, various uh, attack, attack plans, or all, what are called, uh, uh, it's a not plan with a number. He picks the attack option, the, the White House military aide with his satellite phone calls the National Military Command Center down in the Pentagon. They, uh, first thing they do is they validate that the president is the one that's on the phone. Actually, he's the one that, that has to be on the phone. They give him a, a challenge code. He opens up his biscuit, reads the challenge code, then he has his response code. The, uh, the watch officer, National Military Command Center, validates that it is the president. Next thing the president do, does is he, he reads out the, the code word and the number for that particular attack option that, he, that has been recommended he, he launch. Then through the uh, nuclear command and control system, those la launch orders are disseminated to all of our nuclear forces, uh, be it air, land, or sea. So one of the things that is a basic tenant of, of sort of nuclear warfare, one of the first signs that 
that you, your country is going to be the recipient of a surprise nuclear attack is if your command and control system is targeted. That in and of itself is considered an act of war. So if you're Russia, the first thing you're going to do, or China, when you're going to uh, when you're going to launch a full-scale attack against the U.S., you're going to launch a small number of nuclear weapons, nuclear ICBMs, that are going to detonate in the upper atmosphere. What that does is that creates an electromagnetic pulse that degrades, kind of kills everybody's electronics, but electronics that are hardened against EMP pulses typically are not going to be susceptible. But essentially, it's an electronic attack via the use of an EMP pulse from a nuclear weapon that is used to degrade your command and control system. So if you're on the American side and you're at NORAD, uh, North American Radar uh, Aerospace Defense, or, um, or at uh, the other facility in Blankenheim, and you detect that your, your, command, your nuclear command and control, your NC3, is being degraded by some kind of interference, the other side isn't just going to do that on their own because that is in, in and of itself is going to motivate the responding country to spin everything up for an immediate response. So it's not something that they're just going to do willy nilly. Also, our nuclear command and control system, as I mentioned, is hardened against EMP attack. You, I, this isn't something that... Um, somebody with their drone can fly something above an antenna and take down our NC3. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work uh, every country's, every nuclear country, their nuclear command and control is, is hardened to survive nuclear attack or interference. So this particular uh, phrase here is, is very, very important because basically what it's saying, uh, if, if, our early warning systems, our nuclear early warning systems, our phased array radar uh, that can detect these small objects, if they detect an unidentified object or that something is tampering with these nuclear systems, that is one of the, that is one of the things that they agree to to notify the other, the other party. Uh, and then we go on here for transmission of urgent information, notifications and requests for information in situations requiring prompt clarification, the party shall make the primary use of the direct communications link between the governments of the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist uh, Republics. Um, what they're talking about is the, is the hotline. So uh, this was uh, signed by an, uh, the... Um, he was the uh, basically Secretary of State, uh, Andrew uh, Gromyko, and then William P. Rogers, who would have been the Secretary of, of State. Um, so, okay, now where I was made aware of this, um, of this agreement uh, quite some time ago and the importance of this particular agreement in terms of, of uh, UAP. So I... So it's about the beginning of February, I began doing February, March. I don't take, I should take, make notes in a journal that I, but I don't. Anyway, I started doing research, further research on this uh, particular agreement. Uh, in April, I traveled to Washington, D.C. and spent a considerable time at the National Archives uh, researching this particular treaty, in particular looking for the negotiating minutes between Russia and the U.S., and uh, from what I was told in the negotiating minutes, there was considerable language about UAP triggering a nuclear war on either side, either by UAP uh, interfering with our nuclear command, con command and control systems or nuclear weapon, or excuse me, UFOs interfering with um, uh, our, our strategic nuclear weapons. We know that it's heavily documented that UAPs have tampered um, uh, retargeted and disabled our land-based nuclear weapons. I have no idea if that's been the case for our sea launch st uh, stuff. Uh, George Knapp uh, smuggled documents out of Russia where it turned out that Russia was having the exact same thing and we're actually having instances of nuclear of UFOs uh, spinning up into launch mode their land-based uh, intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles. So uh, this is this is clearly a, 
a big deal. It's also, in my opinion, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons the Air Force has continually lied to the public and, and, um, and, and the CIA, lied to the public and our lawmakers about, the, about, the, about UFOs tampering with our, our uh, stuff. Now, after doing, so going back to NARA, researched at NARA, uh, I found uh, this particular document that I'm about to show you was completely redacted at NARA. And, you know, so I didn't bother copying it or anything like that. Anyway, this document I just happened to discover after spending probably a couple of days uh, going through Google and looking for, for very specific keywords. I didn't need uh, I didn't need to be the FOIA king or anything like that. Uh, anybody anybody can do this uh, thing. So, the document that I'm about to show you is the actual operating instructions for the uh, for the Russia uh, uh, Russia. Washington nuclear hotline, which the, the formal name of this hotline is called DC MoLink or DC, um, uh, DC, uh, Moscow, uh, DC, uh, direct communication link, Moscow, DC MoLink. Um, okay. So no one has seen this. Uh, when I found this document, I, as I mentioned before, I do a lot of stuff behind the scenes that I don't speak publicly about. I shared this document with people uh, that would understand the importance of it. And it was, of course, introduced in congressional testimony when, when David Grush uh, testified to, uh, to Congress about uh, this uh, illegal program that, um, that the Air Force has been hiding. And now we know the CIA has been, been uh, hiding as well. So here it is was surprisingly declassified. I couldn't believe this. Again, the version of this that I saw or that I looked at in the uh, State Department records during the Nixon administration at the National Archives had this copy, but it was hev heavily redacted. Memorandum for the Assistant of the President for National Security Affairs. Subject, communications between U.S. and the USSR in time of crisis. The attached paper responds to your request for a description and evaluation of communication between the U.S. and USSR in time of crisis. The paper concentrates on the capabilities and procedures associated with the USA, uh, USSR Direct Communications Link, DCL MoLink, or hotline, which is operated by the Department of Defense. The normal diplomatic channels and circuits maintained by the Department of State are available when time is not a critical factor. In emergencies, however, the MoLink uh, provides the most rapid and direct communications linkage between the President of the United States and the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Also included with this paper is a copy of September, September 30th, 1976 protocol on the use of immediate notifications in implementation, implementation of the agreement on the measures of, of, uh, to reduce the outbreak of nuclear war between the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, September 30th, 1971. 1976 protocol becomes effective on March 30th, 1977 and provides for reduced MoLink transition times through the use of pre-agreed short messages consisting of a code word and a numerical designator. So again, so again, a bit about nuclear warfare. The, the amount of time that the president has to decide on how to respond to what's called a nuke flash or nuclear uh, flash message that would come from uh, it would, it would come out of NORAD, it would filter uh, through the National Military Command Center, and then it's immediately the guy that has a nuclear football picks up the phone and is appraised of this of this thing. There is usually, if if uh, um, let's say Russia is going to launch a nuclear strike on the U.S., in addition to what would be launched in space, the other thing that would follow up would be most likely a nuclear tipped uh, sea launch cruise missile, sea launch ballistic cruise missile launched right off the East Coast 
uh, and the idea is to knock out the White House as quickly as you can so the president cannot disseminate a nuclear war order or emergency action message to the nuclear forces. So this gets back to the whole concept that this communications between Russia and the U.S. have to happen quickly because the president is under a tremendous time crunch to decide whether he's going to respond to a, a warning of, and there's a whole concept called launch on warning, which is basically if our nuclear forces are, are, are in a posture of, of launch on warning, they, uh, they'll launch immediately upon warning. So this is where this Washington Moscow link is important. So a uh, report is based on chairman of joint chiefs of staff. I don't know how this got declassified. I'm blown away by it. Uh, so let's see here. So let's see. All right, this goes on to describe how this works, communication between the US and USSR. Two direct methods are available to the president. In those situations where time is not a factor, communication through normal dipl diplomatic uh, uh, channels is used. The National Military Command Center in the Pentagon is the primary Washington Molik terminal and is responsible for routine testing, messaging, accountability, and, excuse me, translation method uh, mess services. A second terminal in the alternate military command center, uh, which is um, basically a backup facility. At, uh, it's also called Raven Rock. And MCC's personnel are responsible for periodic testing of the terminal. A third terminal located in the White House can act as an independent center for originating and receiving messages using special uh, privacy and override features. White House terminal is tested. All outgoing messages require presidential authorization either directly from the, from the president or through the Secretary of State, SecDef, or assistant uh, uh, to the uh, president. Uh, the text of the outgoing message may be transmitted uh, from the White House using the National Military Command Center Senator by secure long distance Xerox LDX secure teletype. Before releasing the message, the Deputy Director for Operations must contact the White House Situation Room, make sure that, um, that uh, the President is approved. This process may take as little as five minutes. Again, speed is key here. All USSR initiated messages are received in Russian. More detailed description of facilities, procedures, and, and uh, whatnot is, is uh, shown in tab B. Again, this was a secret uh, document. Um, let's see. Uh, this talks about alternate uh, direct communication link terminals. We won't get into that. Outgoing messages. Very little time is required to process and transmit a message. A two or three sentence nuke flash message. Nuke flash is the highest probably one of the highest uh, categorized uh, messages that can come through on, on your nuclear command and control system. It's called nuke flash or nuclear flash message. Nu uh, uh, nuke flash conference uh, could be transmitted to Moscow within five minutes. Again, this, 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 they receive a warning. President's on the phone. Uh, NORAD is on the phone. Uh, US STRATCOM is on the phone. Uh, and they, they conduct uh, what is uh, you know what is called a, a a nuke flash conference where they talk about what is happening and and recommend to the president how they should respond. Personnel in Washington Moscow terminals work together closely on an hourly basis to maintain uh, the highest level. All right, and this is how it all works. Incoming message. The, in the event of an incoming message, the deputy director for operations at the National Military Command Center notifies a senior watch officer at the White House Situation Room. As, and this is the guy, the senior watch officer is the guy with the nuclear football, uh, the White House military aide. As soon as the message is transmitted, a copy is sent to the White House Situation Room. Translation time varies according to length. Previous experience, former presidents have chosen not to release information about their uses of MoLink, except for the exchanges which have occurred during the 1967 Arab-Israeli uh, conflict. Experience has shown that a message transmitted via MoLink will receive the immediate attention of the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the, of the Soviet Union. So this thing is, is indeed a, uh, a gets immediate reaction from the president of Russia. That's how serious this, this thing is. Okay, um, 
Now we're going to get into the UAP stuff. Now, one thing I would, would point out, if you listen to David Grush's testimony, he tried to gain visibility into, uh, into a red line nuke flash traffic uh, that the White House has, uh, has e experienced over the years. This would include traffic related, nuke flash traffic using the DCL MoLink system on UAP. That's why he's trying to get at it. That's probably why I couldn't find any further documentation at the at NARA National Archives. Um, but if you're a lawmaker, and this is why David Grush said this to the lawmakers, you need to subpoena, you need to look for the redacted records, nuke flash traffic going in and out of the White House over the past decades, you're going to find stuff there. Okay. So this gets into the, into the nitty gritty of it. And this, this gets into the, uh, what's agreed upon in, the, in this operating, uh, operating do, uh, document. The parties uh, shall be guided by the following agreed provisions regarding emergency situations corresponding short messages to be transmitted and pre-agreed texts and full message. Situation one. Uh, uh, accidental or unauthorized or unexplained incident involving a possible detonation of a nuclear weapons which could create the risk of outbreak of nuclear war between Russia and the USSR. Short message to be transmitted. Adam, A-T-O-M, 111. And the text of the full message, this is what was pre-agreed upon in this, um, in this document. Uh, this treaty that was signed, this pre, the pre-agreed upon message with the pre-agreed upon code word and numerical, uh, numerical designation of 111, uh, the text of that, an accidental, unauthorized, or un other unexplained incident involving a possible detonation of nuclear weapon, which could create the risk of outbreak of nuclear war, has occurred. This message constitutes notification in accordance with the agreement on measures to reduce the risk of outbe outbreak of nuclear war between the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, September 30th, 1971. Details to follow. So the idea here is when uh, when they're picking up the hotline and they are transmitting this pre pre approved message package with a with a de with a, a numerical designator and a code word. The idea it's not telling the whole story. The idea is to tell Russia or Russia tells us because they have the exact same language that this is what has occurred information to follow. Okay. Uh, now this is where we get into what I was told is UAP. Situation two, detection by missile warning systems of unidentified objects of such occurrence could create a risk of outbreak of nuclear war between the USA, or USA and the USSR. Short message to be transmitted, Adam 222, text a full message. Our missile warning systems have detected unidentified objects. And this occurrence could create a risk of outbreak of nuclear war. This message constitutes notification in accordance of the agreement on the measures to reduce uh, the risk of outbreak of nuclear war. Now, it could be, it could be argued that uh, this is a catch-all, but uh, from, from uh, what, what was uh, basically expressed to me was that this is uh, primarily uh, a, a UAP uh, thing. So um, going back here, uh, uh, this is uh, other, other, um, other messages, unexplained nuclear incident, uh, Adam 555, situation six, nuclear accident. Um, and I think that's, uh, yeah, so, so this has more of uh, kind of how this protocol of the secret document was, um, was uh, disseminated and when it takes effect. Um, but anyway, so that was, this is a document that David Grush uh, suggested. It's an open source document. I don't know how it got declassified. Um, keep in mind too, sorry, camera's losing, losing focus here. Keep in mind too, the, these hotlines now exist with other countries. So Russia, India, China, nuclear, uh, uh, France, all of these, all of these, 
all of these um, countries have a similar system uh, to this. Uh, from what I understand, uh, the, the uh, direct communication link terminals and the protocols of, code, of coded messages have been greatly, greatly expanded. Again, this one didn't come into play until 1977, so that I believe would have been uh, would have been uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, ad administration. But the you know the, the the key takeaway here is is you you have um, you know you you have baked into our nuclear command and control system. Uh, you, you have uh, precautions to make sure that Russia or the U.S., if, if Russia uh, determines that there's a fleet of UAPs flying over the North Poles, their, their early warning systems have detected the existence of these objects. The first thing Russia is going to do, Russia is going to know, hey, the U.S. is going to see these things flying over the North Pole. They could mistake them for nuclear-tipped ICBMs heading their way. So we know they're UAP or UFO, uh, so we're going to immediately transmit this message using the direct communication uh, link, Moscow link. We're, gonna, we're going to send this code, this code word, this message to the U.S. saying that we, Russia, have detected unidentified objects and we basically are wanting you to know these are not from us. Uh, this is not a nuclear strike. This is not a preemptive nuclear strike. These are unidentified objects that are not related to us, and we're letting you know that we've detected them so you don't misinterpret these objects on your radar as being a, a, uh, a first nuclear strike. So that's, that's pretty, pretty significant. So we're going to wrap it up here. I know we've been on a long time. Apologies for the... Um, for the for the technical issues, it takes a while for YouTube to process this video out, so I can go back and 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 remove that. But the, if there are any lawmakers, we know that we know that congressional staff uh, staff watch our show, and what I would say say to all of you guys is this is stuff that you need to know about. This is stuff that the United States Air Force, the CIA. These are all the things that they've been hiding from our lawmakers. These are all the things that they're hiding from you that we elect to make sound decisions about our national security. When the CIA is running illegal programs through the Office of Global Access and stuff going on in JSOC behind your back and not briefing you on it, m much of this illegal, we, how can you operate on behalf of Americans and make the right decisions for our country if they are hiding this stu stuff from you? I think what we've learned tonight, especially from looking at this intelligence document from Australia, is the United States Air Force, the Pentagon, the Central Intelligence Agency has been taking this stuff no shit seriously for a very long time and they've been lying to the American public about it and they've been lying to Congress about it and they've been lying to the executive branch about it. Taking this stuff, these classified programs, spreading them across different nodes of government so that a senator that only sees the Senate Intel, uh, the Senate, uh, DOD, uh, Senate DOD side but not the Senate Intel side can't, has no idea what's going on the intelligence side, or a senator that sits on Senate Intel but doesn't sit on SASC and can't see what the Department of Defense is doing, they can't see the whole site picture because the CIA and the Air Force and the Pentagon writ large has gone out of their way to hide this from you so you don't know about it. A democracy cannot function at all when you have a group of 50 Senior, uh, senior executive service level uh, deputy, uh, uh, deputy heads, such as uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks, categorizing special access programs as waived so that you, Congress, can't find out exactly what is going on. It's un-American and it is not how our country is supposed to, uh, supposed to be run. So, going back to this whole nuclear issue, we, nuclear weapons are our crown jewel. We have the nuclear triad, land-based, sea-based, 
air, uh, air, air based nuclear weapons. Uh, when the idea of the nuclear triad, the way that it is structured, is that if, if one part of our triad is knocked out, let's say um, our, our uh, uh, B-52 bombers with uh, nuclear-tipped uh, cruise missiles are all knocked out of the sky, you have the other two legs of the nuclear triad to provide a, 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 a counterforce, counterattack, or nuclear deterrent. When you have UAPs disabling or, or tampering and retargeting one third of our nuclear triad, our land-based strategic nuclear weapons, and we know there, has been, there have been plenty of documented cases of UFOs disabling uh, these systems, and, and these Air Force officers who had to deal with this stuff forced to sign uh, from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, uh, national non-disclosure agreements where they can't talk about this stuff even to their congressmen. I mean, that is, it's, it's wrong, it's un-American, and people in Congress, you need to ask questions. You need to subpoena all of the interview records of nuclear launch control officers and nuclear above ground security forces, you need to subpoena the records from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations where they have debriefed all of these people and you need to look at the non-disclosure agreements that they forced them to sign where they can't talk about this stuff. Now, I believe hopefully now with the good stuff that Senator Gillibrand uh, has, has done that, that, that is, uh, that's not going to be an issue. But at the end of the day, when you have our nuclear command control system built, uh, messaging built in to make sure that UAP do not accidentally trigger a nuclear war, that tells you right there that this UAP UFO issue is a national security issue. It's a national security issue that frankly, you cannot trust the Pentagon or the Central Intelligence Agency to do the right thing for the country and come clean with the lawmakers that they work for. Reminders, CIA, Air Force, the Pentagon, they work for us, it's not the other way around. And when, they're, when they are lying to, um, to our lawmakers and to uh, the elected officials and viewing them in a a gross perverted way that they're just temporary employees and they do not need to be briefed on this stuff, it, you know, it makes me damn mad. And the, the fact that you had uh, Congressman Mike Turner and any of these other folks that managed to derail the, the uh, UAP Disclosure Act of 2023, that tells you all you need to know on whether you should believe a damn thing coming out of the Pentagon's mouth or the CIA's mouth. You cannot trust them. And we, we live in a democracy, not a military junta. So anyway, enough of my rant. So I'm gonna take a few questions here. Um, I know we've gone really long, but I thought this was a, uh, a really important uh, uh, ses uh, session. Again, thank you everyone for the, uh, for the uh, super chats, especially <laughs> in light of the, the train wreck of, of how this whole thing uh, started. Uh, okay, Carrie Rosen, thanks for the super chat. Uh, Heiser Rosie, thank you for the super chat. Uh, Carolina Garzina from Vinny, uh, audio is bumping. Yeah, sorry about that. Smoking gun document. Thanks for all you do from Craig L. Thank you. Um, uplifting uh, uh, tweets. We, we've had some really great mods that volunteer their time to sit on these things. They take time out of their day to manage our chat rooms and we very, very much appreciate all that they do to help uh, bring you this show, because I can't do it on my own, that's for sure. Uh, Catgirl1, is there a link to the documents online? I will post the link later. To be honest, I have to go and, and dig up the link. Uh, I, will, I will post the CIA, um, their UFO uh, 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 collection. In terms of the, the, the accidental war agreement, I'll post that later too, and I'll also post the link 
to the uh, MoLink operational document that I still, for the life of me, don't know why they declassified that. Um, okay, so Sean's already gone because this thing's taking forever. Uh, from a Russian space program, Matt, can, uh, Matt and Sean, can you put a link to all those documents? Yes, yeah, sorry, I did that. Uh, let's see, uh, Tucker, ask David, uh, did the government have any special aircraft on David? Day? I'm not sure what that means, uh, but thanks for the nice super chat, really generous. Super, people have been really generous with the super chats. I very much appreciate that. Um, Science Bob, thanks, thanks guys. Science Bob rocks. I'm going to have him on hopefully some, some point soon and hope to be on Spaced Out Radio uh, Dave at Spaced Out Radio really gave me some great advice at the beginning of this and has been a mentor and really, um, really been a friend of the show. Uh, CPLA B3, ontological shock has been motivating cover up for decades. I think it's ontological shock, but I also think, um, for one, it's the Air Force not wanting to admit that they can't protect our skies. It's a government, the Pentagon admitting that they really can't do anything about this. But at the, at the end of the day, it, people need to be told, the American people are ready to be told, we can handle it, um, it's, it's, it's gotta happen. Not everything, I agree that there's some things regarding national security, but in general, Pentagon, CIA, they have to, be, they have to stop lying about this and they have to stop hiding from Congress, period, the end. Uh, let's see, somebody was uh, spamming the chat. Hopefully he went away. Um, thanks, Matt and guests, for all the time you gave on the UAP issue. All the best from Down Under. That was from Townie, 3057. You got it. Uh, thanks. Um, probably wrapping up. Uh, thanks for your help tonight. And I think that might be it. Uh, uh, so yeah, so people are asking for the links. We'll be sure to put that up. Uh, Joe Mergia, um, he, uh, he is, I'm going to put a post to this. Actually, I had lunch with Joe. I was going to have him on this weekend. I decided I wasn't going to do a show today. And then at the last minute, uh, did it. And Joe, my apologies. I it completely slipped my mind that we spoke. We'll have Joe on, uh, very soon. Uh, but I told him about this nuclear war document when I was uh, in Vegas recently. And, uh, and I'm going to post a link. I'll do it on the, on the, on my Twitter account as well. Uh, Joe found something as well that I think is important. Uh, it's uh, the 1961 S SNIE or sign, but I'm going to post a link to that. Joe said it was very important and it related to this thing. Um, uh, he goes, uh, Joe uh, says here, this is a doc I was telling you about, uh, the 1961 sign. My blogs from 2020 include an excerpt from the article in a French magazine, VSD, I believe this is what you were referring to. These concerns were taken seriously enough to be incorporated into the 1971 Agreement on Measures to Reduce the Outbreak of Nuclear War, which is what we spoke about. Uh, the Cometa uh, assures its readers that UFOs have not been the cause of any hostile acts through uh, intimidation maneuvers uh, have to be uh, uh, concerned. So anyway, um, that's about it. I've been on here a awful, uh, awful long time. Um, but folks, uh, again, if, if you enjoy our show, please tell your friends about us. We're very small. We don't have a big following yet. Um, and again, if, uh, please give us a follow on Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. The links are in there. I appreciate everybody's, um, uh, patience in our major audio issues that we had, uh, after the video is processed in YouTube, we'll be sure to, uh, to repair it and have it so other people can enjoy this. Uh, anyway, uh, call your congressman, tell them that what happened at the UAP uh, uh, Disclosure Act is unacceptable. Call your congressman, ask them to ask what the CIA Office of Global Access, what they've been up to, ask them what Joint Special Operations Command and Air Force Special Operations Command have been up to in terms of UAP crash retrievals and what they have been hiding from Congress. It's time they come clean with their lawmakers. It's time that these folks treat our country like the democracy it's supposed to be and what our founding fathers intended for this country and for our children. Because right now what's going on at the Pentagon and the Central Intelligence Agency uh, writ large, uh, this isn't America. Uh, this has got to change. And only by talking to your members of Congress can you make this happen. Let's get out there and do it.